do I call <laughs> How do I call you? Uh, Yang or? Uh, yeah, you can call me Zhang or. Uh, oh, Zhang. Yeah, well, Franz when Rice. I was living in Indonesia, people used to call me Fran. Franz. Oh, Franz. Mm, Franz. Okay, <laughs> that's good. Okay, I will start uh, for the general lecture today, and then I will come you all. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. I hope you well today and happy. That's the important things. And uh, today we invite Professor Yang Francois Bissonnet. I do not know how this it is uh, correct or not to call it that. Sorry. Perfect. Uh, from from uh, Laval University. It is a university in Canada. I think it's in the. Uh, French speaking the territory in uh, Canada. And before we proceed to the general lecture, uh, let me invite uh, Professor Saman Hudi. He is uh, Dean of Faculty of Agriculture, Universitas Pas Maret. So uh, time is yours, Professor Saman Hudi, to open this uh, general lecture. Time is yours. Oke, okay. terima kasih Pak Happy. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ladies and gentlemen, the participant of general lecture and the oil palm agribusiness controversies in Indonesia. Welcome all of you to this general lecture which has received remarkable attention from students and academics. First of all, let us thank Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, the Almighty who has given His grace and guidance, so that this lecture is held successfully. I express my highest gratitude and appreciation to the speaker, Professor John Isonat. Uh, I believe that this lecture will present in insightful and another perspective on the period of oil palm agribusiness in Indonesia. This lecture will not be well organized without the support of various collaborators, especially the Universitas Plus Marat and the participants. Therefore, I want to express my gratitude. I especially thank the head of study program of agribusiness, Ibu Dr. Sri Marwanti, and the organizing committees for their work, their hard work. Pressure parents and patients in preparing and organizing this general lecture to go well smoothly and successfully. Ladies and gentlemen, concerning educational aspect, the study program of agribusiness needs to improve the quality of learning and student learning experience throughout experience taught by professor from top university in the world. Hopefully, it will end enhance knowledge, skills, and global perspective because not all students have the opportunity of international student action. Indonesia is currently the world's largest producer of crude palm oil, but this has not been done in sustainable manner. Most of our GPO production still comes from plantation expansion, while the contribution from increased productivity is still re relatively uh, relatively small. Therefore, Indonesia needs a new strategy in developing the oil palm agribusiness system in the future. This general lecture is very relevant to the important issues of palm oil agribusiness in Indonesia. 
I believe this lecture will open up our students' insights about oil palm agribusiness. Finally, this general lecture let us extend the network and cooperation among the Universitas 11 Maret and Laval University, Canada in education, research, publication. Moreover, it can impact the study program of agribusiness to build better agriculture, especially agribusiness in Indonesia and in the world. By saying Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, I open this general lecture. Welcome and enjoy this lecture. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Saman Hudi, for giving uh, opening remark for this uh, general lecture. And then uh, I should ask to the committee first whether we should uh, uh, should start for the general lecture or we uh, start for the Indonesian national anthem first before we uh, proceed to the general lecture. Derek saja pak seharusnya kalau seharusnya sebelum Prof Saman tadi kalau mau menggunakan. I forgot about that. Okay, I will proceed to the general lecture. Before I proceed to this general lecture, I would like to uh, present a brief uh, background of Professor Yang Franchois Bisonet. Uh, Professor Franz Choi, uh, Yang Franchois, uh, Professor Franz, he holds PhD in Geography from University of Toronto. And he already, he undertaken many, many research on political ecologies of agriculture, ecology of agriculture and environments, and especially in Southeast Asia and for Canada. And currently he holds the uh, head as a director of a research center at Laval University. So his background is uh, political ecology and environmental ethics, if I'm not uh, mistaken, uh, including uh, research on social and political representation of environment, agrarian issue, and emerging private and non-government environmental reg regulations. That's a background of Professor Franz. And today, he will present about the oil plantation controversy in Indonesia. I think this is uh, in line with the current issue in Indonesia, especially for the negative externality of oil plantations, even though we know that uh, oil plantation uh, give uh, opportunity for small holder and also for the unfortunate uh, people in Indonesia to uh, raise their income. But uh, there, there are negative impact of uh, uh, oil plantation, oil palm plantation in Indonesia, especially for uh, uh, sorry, carbon emissions and etc. So to, to cut the uh, short time, I would like to uh, invite Professor Franz to present his, uh, uh, not paper, yeah, to present his opinion or his uh, view about the uh, oil palm plantation in Indonesia. Time is your Professor Franz. And then I think we have around 30 minutes and for your presentation and afterward we can discuss or you can uh, prolong your your uh, lecture today so time is yours good luck and terima enjoy kasih. your presentation terima kasih banyak professor irawan terima kasih no i'm not professor, professor for, oh. i'm sorry <laughs> oh, <it's> okay <laughs> no. i'm only uh, just a lecture okay okay well, lecture irawan uh, <laughs> professor samahud saman Hundi, Profesor Andrian Darti, um, saya senang bisa membicarakan penelitian saya hari ini. Uh, terima kasih telah mengundang saya. 
Uh, I will uh, use English for my presentation uh, today, as I am more fluent in English and uh, I haven't spoken Indonesian in a long time. But feel free to ask questions in Indonesian in Bahasa Indonesia uh, after my presentation. Uh, what I've prepared should take about uh, 40 minutes to present, uh, which uh, should leave us with uh, perhaps uh, 20 minutes for uh, questions. Um, so do not hesitate to tell me if I take uh, too much time or I will also try to watch time on my end. Um, what I want to talk about today as um, my distinguished uh, um, uh, colleagues uh, announced is uh, a number of uh, controversies surrounding all palm agribusiness in, in Indonesia. I also want to present um, my uh, conceptual or theoretical perspective on political ecology. But first of all, I wanted to say a few words about my relationship with uh, Indonesia and Southeast Asia. I started uh, getting interested in uh, land use issues in Southeast Asia uh, during my master's thesis when I was uh, at the University of Montreal. This is when I went to Malaysia uh, on the island of Borneo in Sarawak and Sabah, and uh, I got interested into uh, oil palm production over there. There were also conflicts uh, related to uh, land uh, ownership uh, between indigenous communities, uh, oil palm companies. And then for my doctorate, for my PhD, I uh, decided to uh, go to Indonesia, where I discovered uh, your beautiful uh, nation, very diverse, and met uh, lots of uh, people for my interviews, trying to know more about uh, the different aspects of oil palm production and uh, looking at uh, labor issues as well, which I will talk a little bit about um, uh, very soon. Uh, doing field work in Indonesia was a great experience to me, and I encourage you also. Uh, I'm sure you're doing uh, lots of work uh, outside in the in the field, but uh, doing field work in geography was a great experience to me. Um, so. Uh, this is an outline of my presentation. I want to say a few words about the approach I'm using, political ecology. Then I will talk about agribusiness expansion and then provide a narrative of my own perspective on the old palm uh, production. So what is political ecology? Well, it is uh, what we could call a, a school of thought. Or it's an approach. Um, it's uh, basically allowing us to uh, have a critical uh, outlook in environmental studies. And uh, we're using what we call a constructivist approach, uh, which means that uh, we're interested in uh, perceptions of people. So we know that there's an objective reality outside, but what we want to know mainly is how people address this objective reality. Uh, so we're also interested in knowledge production and discourses on the environment. Um, but this is only one part of political ecology because there's also a more positivist approach. Perhaps you are trained more in this approach. Well, uh, it, um, it, it uh, states that there is an objective reality which we can know, not know directly. So we try to know it through uh, data, uh, basically mapping, uh, spatial analysis, a detailed description of the state of ecosystems. Uh, and monitoring the impacts of policies on the environment. So this is another part of political ecology uh, that's very useful to try to better understand what is going on uh, in some place. So some of the authors that I am drawing on in political ecology, you can state uh, Michel Foucault, uh, he provides very uh, important conceptual tools to analyze these courses. Uh, Edward Said on uh, Orientalism, a very important author. James C. Scott, which you have maybe read, uh, is talking a lot about um, the moral economy, so how people, even though they are facing an unfair situation, will try to uh, create mechanisms to uh, make the situation more equal, more fair. We observe that also in the uh, oil palm uh, sector. And Eleanor Ostrom, a very important uh, um, researcher, a very important author who tried to conceptualize common pool resources. These are the resources such as uh, uh, water, uh, soil, biodiversity. Um, the water, uh, these are resources that uh, cannot be appropriated 
definitely. So they need to be shared. And in order to be shared, well, we need to create institutions uh, that will allow fair and transparent ways of managing these resources. That's a big issue for the old palm sector in Indonesia. So when I'm talking about this political ecology approach, I'm talking about a way to analyze discourses and practices on the environment. And I wanted to give you an example of um, this approach. Uh, this is an article um, that was published uh, recently, and the author is trying to analyze the science and policy discourse of desertification in China. So what the author is uh, saying is not that there is no desertification, right? Desertification is, is a true phenomenon in China. However, the way that authorities try to deal with this phenomenon is not ideal because it's a very top-down approach, uh, a very, uh, um, I would say, um, um, authoritarian approach to uh, managing desertification, which involves planting and counting the number of trees planted. Uh, instead of uh, trying to allow for natural regeneration of uh, forests or trees. So um, as you can see, there is always um, a political objective behind any kind of ecological restoration. In this case, particularly, and as many other places in the world, often we're more interested in the number of trees that we plant than uh, about the uh, actual effects of this action, right? So uh, all that authorities want is to be able to say we have planted 1 million trees, but we don't really monitor the survival rate or uh, the effect on the ground for the local economy, so on and so forth. So that's the kind of uh, questions that we raise in political uh, ecology. That's the kind of stuff we want to know. Um, political ecology is complex, so there is different ways to address the different, uh, um, let's say, uh, concept, concepts and propositions in uh, political ecology. So it can be more, as I was saying, more constructivist, which means we are interested more in, in discourses and policies, or it can be more, let's say, a positivist, uh, which means we're interested more in the facts about the way that the environment, the, the ecosystems will be changing. In between, you have critical realism. So you acknowledge that there are policies. Policies are uh, human social constructions. And uh, science, I mean, positivism, uh, it's a scientific construction to, um, to apprehend in order to understand the ecological reality. And when it comes to methods, you have uh, discourses, perception analysis, and you have also uh, scientific ecology, which would be more related to positivism. Um, as you say, as you can see, there are some uh, traces of uh, uh, French on my presentation, right? I meant to write discourses, but it's uh, French discours. Um, so we can see that political ecology is a paradigm or a new paradigm uh, that is uh, very uh, important given that uh, our species, right, the human species under actual conditions uh, have thoroughly, have radically reshaped the face of the earth, that the human species has become uh, a force of geological magnitude that has uh, that his have that is having impacts that will be lasting for uh, thousands of years to come. If tomorrow the human species was to disappear, uh, the the way that we have transformed the Earth would be lasting for for thousands of years. Uh, so ecology has entered the domain of politics because politics is simply what human societies do to organize themselves. Um, and, um, well, the Earth's ecology is thoroughly transformed by human activities and therefore by politics. And so we cannot distinguish anymore so well uh, ecology and politics. That's why political ecology has emerged. So any kind of environmental science, any action that we have on our environment is also political because it's related to a system that was created, that was engineered for certain purposes. So the earth is thoroughly reshaped. As you can see, uh, the, the traces of human activities will be uh, present on, on the earth for, for a countless uh, number of years to come. 
I wanted to talk about agribusiness expansion uh, just because, um, well, it is the context uh, that we live in and that uh, all palm expansion in, in, in Indonesia is also um, mirrored by uh, the expansion of other crops outside uh, Indonesia, uh, elsewhere in the world. We can think about uh, soybean expansion in Brazil, for instance, in Paraguay. So these are all related to a global wave of large scale land acquisition by international and national actors, which we call uh, in critical terms land grabbing. Of course, we may not acknowledge all the time that it is land grabbing. Land grabbing is more a critical perspective on this phenomenon. Uh, what we notice worldwide uh, on an international, on a global scale, is the conversion of small scale diversified agroforestry systems, like the ones I've seen in Indonesia, their conversion into industrial monocultures. So we can witness nowadays, and it's been the case for the past, well, the past uh, 50 years, basically, or even more, is a simplification of ecosystems in order to produce one crop and to produce it more intensively. And so we can see that there is globally an integration of agribusiness sectors and the creation of new commercial outlets, such as agrofuels for oil palm, for uh, uh, soy, uh, soybean oil, for instance, uh, which enables continual expansion of the sector. There's also a growing uh, demand for food products as well. Uh, but I wanted to tell you uh, an interesting fact. Did you know that our cows here in Canada, in Quebec, uh, they also consume palm oil, right? We uh, in, import a lot of, uh, of palm oil products from Indonesia, well, to consume it ourselves in, in the products that in, in the processed foods that we buy, but also to feed our cows. So the, the milk that we drink basically um, is also partly um, related to uh, the palm oil sector in Indonesia. So we are very much connected on this planet. And what is happening in, in, in Indonesia is, is a matter of concern to all other citizens of the world. Same thing as what we are doing with our forests in Canada should be a matter of concern for Indonesian citizens. So we do not have so much the luxury today of, um, of not uh, seeing or not understanding what is going on uh, around the world. We are all intrinsically connected, interconnected with each other. So thinking about the large scale monocultures and agribusiness uh, in the world. So uh, we can think about a few crops that have come to dominate agricultural production globally. And uh, first comes soybean oil with 100 million hectares. So uh, this, this is a considerable uh, area of the earth. Um, second is cotton for clothing, but also for vegetable oil. Uh, sugar cane for fuel, but for the sugar we consume. And then fourth uh, of these large scale monocultures is uh, oil palm. Of course, we would have corn before, we would have other crops, but oil palm is still a major um, crop uh, cultivated on the surface of the earth. And more problematically, oil palm can only be cultivated around the equator where it is very hot, moist, and where we used to find a uh, tropical forest, right? Uh, rain, tropical rainforest, as we would call it in ecological terms. So that is what is problematic about old palm. But old palm is not more or less problematic than soybean. Soybean is, is way less productive. We need way more land to produce the same amount of vegetable oil when we cultivate soybean than old palm. Old palm is, is very productive. On one hectare of land, we grow a lot of, uh, of vegetable oil. The only issue is that it's located uh, on the most biodiverse biodiverse parts of the world. So this is a, a, a map of uh, the uh, surface of the earth that is uh, con that is being transformed for agriculture. Well, agriculture is concentrated on certain parts of the world, uh, but, but growing, expanding also in, in new parts such as Borneo and certain parts of, of Sumatra. Uh, 
So now uh, moving on to the main topic of this presentation, which is uh, oil palm and agricultural policies in Indonesia. And, and of course, I have my own perspective and I am not an Indonesian citizen, right? Uh, and of course, you may have a different opinion and I would be happy to hear it. I'm not here to teach you about a, a specific truth. I'm more here to discuss ideas with you. Um, so globally in Indonesia as elsewhere, this is the case also for Canada, the state policies are usually uh, adverse. They usually neglect the needs of smallholders, right? Small peasants, for instance, just because all states around the world have more interest in supporting large scale producers, large scale companies that will invest lots of money and generate high, huge volumes. So it, it's a bias towards large scale uh, production, which is detrimental to uh, smallholders for different or numerous reasons, right? The, the smallholders um, have systems uh, that are more complex in terms of tenure, right? The land ownership is more complex. The production system is more complex. So that's uh, harder for the state to manage. It's harder for the states to support a small farm that produces 10 different crops than to support uh, uh, a large uh, company that will produce only one thing. Um, so there are also uh, agricultural policies that, that support these large scale systems as development tools. Uh, if we look at the history of Indonesia, uh, well, we can think about a number of, of uh, programs such as the PIR Trans, right, the Perkabunan Inti Rakyat, which I will talk more later. But this is definitely a state policy that did support a large scale uh, production system, even though it did also help to create a class of smallholders. Um, now, thinking about the Indonesian context, right, we have a, a, an important history of uh, land transformation. And this goes back to uh, the Dutch. Uh, colonial era, right? Colonialism was a bad thing for all peoples on earth. Uh, yet all nations around the world have to live with the consequences of colonialism. And in Indonesia, the Dutch, right? Uh, uh, the Dutch uh, put in place the Transmigrasi uh, program, which meant to redistribute the population of what they considered the crowded islands of Java, Bali, Lombok, to redistribute this population outside of these islands to the less populated islands of uh, uh, Kalimantan, Sumatra, Sulawesi, Papua. And that uh, does mean that uh, you know, the, the Dutch government, the Dutch colonial government, uh, the, had this idea that uh, so-called uh, external islands of Indonesia, such as Kalimantan, were not sufficiently populated, that there was an imbalance in population distribution, and that this policy, this program needed to redistribute population and make sure that agricultural production as well was more diffused throughout the archipelago. Well, the post-colonial government of Indonesia uh, maintained this program and even uh, started to uh, expand to um, scale up, right, to uh, increase the resources allocated to this program, which led to uh, more intensive transmigration. Of course, the transmigration program is a very complex thing, which uh, had profound implications for uh, the economy of, of Indonesia, but also for the, the demographic structure of certain areas. It did not change much what was happening on central islands, right, such as Java, but it did change a lot what was going on in Jambi, for instance, uh, because over there they, they received lots of migrants. But overall, transmigrasi, transmigration, um, was peaceful and uh, was largely uh, beneficial. Um, but the reason why I'm telling you about this program, it's because it comes with the idea that um, certain islands are, are empty and right, and that they need to be developed, that they need to be cultivated. Um, and this idea uh, is contributing also to oil palm expansion today. Um, 
what we've seen right um, in the uh, starting in the late 80s in Indonesia is uh, the Perkebunan uh, Inti Rakyat Transmigrasi program which allowed to redistribute people as well but to develop all palm plantations uh, in Kalimantan and Sumatra but even though also the state company uh, the PTPN uh, also in, uh, developed uh, all palm plantations and the private companies of course and uh, you also had those more recently starting in the 2000s the Credit Cooperasi Primer Angota a new program that uh, was meant to uh, uh, foster partnerships between uh, the private companies and uh, often uh, local communities to develop all palm plantations. But uh, what happened? Uh, well, this started um, under Suharto, the Suharto era, uh, is that, uh, well, the, the Indonesian government was very much open to uh, private investments in in the uh, agrarian sector right in agriculture and so there were lots of large-scale uh, land concessions that were allocated to uh, private companies but to state companies as well uh, for the development of uh, old palm which uh, triggered conflicts of course with the uh, local inhabitants uh, fire uh, but also irregularities in the way that these concessions were granted um, and now uh close to our uh, our time uh, close to nowadays well there were um lots of national uh, from uh well you know from uh, environmental organizations in indonesia such as walhi for instance but you have greenpeace indonesia um, and international pressure from large-scale organizations such as yeah, greenpeace uh, wwf um and uh, they, they also uh, they pressured the state to, uh, to halt, uh, to stop all palm expansion. So the state uh, under uh, Jokowi uh, established a moratorium on permits allocation for all palm uh, plantation. And, um, and then the moratorium was lifted after uh, the uh, permit allocation system was improved. So the moratorium was just meant to order, to put a bit of, um, let's say, clarity in the process of permit uh, allocation. Um, and what we've seen even more recently is that certain provinces, such as West Papua uh, and Papua, have revoked all palm company permits uh, according to uh, uh, allegations of irregularities, uh, lack of respect uh, of uh, regulations, for instance. So we can see um, throughout time that uh, things are changing. They might be changing slowly, according to environmentalists, but uh, definitely it seems that the oil palm sector is now uh, better regulated than it used to be. Uh, but of course, the global demand is increasing. The production is increasing as well, not only because of human consumption, but also because of all the um, outlets that have been created for palm oil, such as uh, uh, animal feed, right? As I was saying, for cows in Canada as well, but also for uh, biofuels, for instance, for energy production. And this is an ethical aspect of um, of biofuel production, right? Is it uh, is it fair to uh, convert? Um, to convert food into fuel? Well, that's definitely an ethical question. So Indonesia has uh, very uh, good conditions for old palm expansion. So the, these are, so, there, there are soil and um, uh, rain conditions that are very conducive to old palm expansion. And then, so there's a huge potential that has already been earmarked, that has already been identified. But it's problematic, right? Because if uh, all this land was to be developed into old palm, well, uh, there would be a significant withdrawal, a significant reduction in forest cover, in biodiversity. There would be uh, huge emissions in carbon because we know that in a tropical forest, right? In a tropical rainforest, most of the carbon is not even in, in, the, in the trunk of a tree or in, in the branches, right? It's in the soil. So when you remove the forest and when you burn the forest, you do remove the carbon in the trees because they end up burning. But you also remove all the carbon in the top layers and, and often in the, in, the, in the bottom layers of the soil. So this is uh, extremely problematic. 
Um, and even more problematic when peat soil burn because the peat soil are basically a concentration of carbon um, over thousands of years. And uh, this carbon is, is basically trapped in the soil, but when it's burned, then it's released in the uh, atmosphere and it's uh, increasing the speed of uh, global warming and, and uh, climate, uh, climate uh, uh, disruption. So for a long time, um, Indonesian authorities believed that uh, agribusiness expansion and oil palm expansion in particular were uh, basically associated to a development project. So the purpose was to create a better livelihood for landless laborers. Um, the purpose was to uplift the well-being of the poorest segment of the population, the landless laborers, the small family farmers, the majority of the people. Um, so this is, might be still true today, because yes, definitely the uh, oil palm sector in Indonesia has created a large number of jobs. We can, I think the, the most recent figures that I've checked uh, were saying that at least 10 million people in Indonesia derive a livelihood, they derive an income from oil palm agribusiness, not all in production, some in transformation, some in export, uh, some in processing, but it is a huge segment of the Indonesian population that benefits from the oil palm sector. So it's, of course, not about uh, replacing this, this uh, economy by, others, by other stuff, but it's about uh, understanding why it's so difficult to regulate this sector. Um, so what we can see, right, is that the monoculture is definitely problematic uh, for biodiversity. It's problematic, uh, but also in terms of job opportunities. It's a single crop that provides so many jobs. Um, and so what, was, what would be happening if, for instance, uh, there was a, a new pathogen, a new disease that, were, that would be affecting the production of oil palm? So there, there is a level of vulnerability in over concentration of, of one crop production. And when we compare the monoculture, the oil palm monoculture with a traditional Javanese landscape, for instance, I think this would be close to the Dieng Plateau, uh, Gunung Dieng, Dieng, right, in Java. Uh, well, we can see that there's a more diversity. Of course, you have food crops like rice, but vegetables, uh, lots of self-consumption is possible, but you have also uh, close by what uh, we could call agroforests, uh, which are, yes, uh, ecologically, they are forests, but uh, from a social and an economic perspective, they are also um, uh, useful uh, and profitable species, tree species that provide fruits, that provide starch, that provide um, wood as well. So it's hard not to think that we do lose something when we replace a biodiverse uh, landscape with a monoculture. But, but we know that it's not that simple, right? That there's, of course, a rationality behind the choice of promoting old palm. It makes sense to a lot of people. So when we look at recent developments, um, we can see that there were lots of, uh, uh, lots of initiatives to try to get large old palm producers, large, large palm oil producers, uh, to uh, commit to eliminate deforestation, peatlands conver conversion, and, and human rights abuse. Um, and the large uh, palm oil producers are able to um, commit, but uh, that does not mean that they control everything that happens, right, in their supply chains. And um, so what we see in the second quote here from uh, Mongabe, which is a, a very important, uh, I would say, a news agency that I consult and, and which I, I gave uh, interviews for as well, is that um, local authorities uh, may not be complying with, uh, let's say, uh, uh, Jokowi's uh, uh, directives, right, or, or the... Uh, direct orders from the central government of Indonesia, because there are so much interests at play, there is so much money as well involved. So um, the uh, irregular oil palm expansion still 
continues uh, outside the regulatory framework. Uh, so the moratorium that was um, uh, put in place in 2015 was uh, covering so a small part actually of the land. Uh, that means that a lot of the land was still available for all palm development. So that's what this figure shows in red. Uh, you see that it is the, the land that was covered by the moratorium where no old palm could be developed. Um, and uh, in gray, the gray area was basically not covered by uh, any uh, specific regulations. And uh, that's why even though deforestation slowed down during the moratorium, it did not stop. So all palm expansion kept going on. And this is an interesting article that I found, uh, which shows that uh, if you try to model economically, the land where uh, old palm is susceptible to expand, well, it covers a large area of Indonesia. So in what you see here in blue um, is the area that is susceptible to be uh, converted into old palm plantations because it is located close to existing plantations and because the soil uh, conditions are favorable and the distance from uh, existing old palm mills the pabrik, right, uh, rendered this expansion profitable. Um, so that's a, an interesting uh, article too that shows that I mean, expansion is susceptible to, to go on. Uh, if we take a, a quote from this article, we can see that um, only 10% of the area susceptible to old palm expansion by 2020 fall within Indonesia forest moratorium. Um, so more than 80% of natural areas vulnerable to old palm expansion by 2020 were not protected by the forest moratorium. So the forest moratorium was not as efficient as we could have believed. Even though this moratorium shows the will of Indonesian authorities to conserve forests, um, well, it does not um, well, protect all, all forests, unfortunately. So it, it could be considered as a compromise, as a deal uh, with uh, the oil palms, oil palms sector. So uh, on this map that we've done ourselves, uh, you can see in green existing oil palm plantations and in uh, pink uh, allocated concessions. Uh, all these concessions, although some of them might have been revoked, but most of them could be uh, converted into old palm in, in the coming years or decades. Uh, so I also wanted to show you um, uh, some of the uh, research that I've conducted on the field um, on the Perkebunan Inti Rakyat scheme production in Kalimantan, Indonesia, in the Sangao area. And what I provide is a social, but also uh, an ecological narrative of industrial and palm oil production. So as I was saying with political ecology, uh, socio-economic perspectives are uh, of course also ecological. And likewise, an ecological account, an ecological investigation is also socio-economic. We can hardly distinguish these two aspects of reality. So the research that I've conducted was mainly done in Kalimantan Barat area, the Sangao, Kabupaten Sangao, but I've also been interested in the experience of uh, workers, of uh, plantation workers coming from Java, Lombok, and uh, Pulau Nias, uh, away from Sumatra. Uh, so uh, with uh, my research uh, assistants, we have been traveling and collecting data and uh, although I'm not going to present here any detailed uh, data, I, I just wanted to say these words about the, the methodology, but we did uh, surveys basically uh, and more uh, qualitative analysis then. Um, so I want to focus here though on one field work that I've done in the in Kabupaten Sangao, uh, where you can see on the picture, on the, the map on the right, uh, the tenure, right? Uh, these are all the concessions that have been allocated in Kalimantan Barat. They basically cover uh, more than half the area of the, the district. 
uh, even though they are not all converted into old palm, it is it is definitely a hotspot for uh, old palm expansion. And the landscape is also radically transformed. Uh, going on the uh, Songhai Capuas, uh, we can see numerous old palm mills, right, the pabrik, uh, which are day and night processing the uh, old palm fruit bunch, uh, the uh, buasawit. And um, so, uh, of course, it creates pollution, but it also changes local climate uh, because once you remove the uh, rainforest and you replace it with uh, the old palm, well, uh, there the there is more um, sun rays that will hit the ground and uh, heat the ground area, so it creates more uh, hotter conditions. Uh, so this is what you can see from the. Sungai Capuas, and uh, also I wanted to uh, uh, bring your draw your attention to um, the villages that existed before uh, Old Palm was established on a large scale. So what you see here is a is a Kampung Melayu that has been there for uh, decades, and when the uh, state authorities, the private companies arrived to develop the Perkebunan Inti Rakyat project. Um, well, they, they definitely laid down the plantation around the village, reshaping the local economy, of course. But also what it created is a new ground for uh, orang transmigran, right? the, the transmigrants who came and uh, started living there. So. Uh, even though it was not all negative, of course, it created new economic opportunities, but it did create this radical change right, in the life and the economy of the people living there. So comparing the uh, Kampung Melayu with uh, the Kapling, right, uh, the, the local uh, uh, settlement for uh, plantation workers that was constructed by the PTPN, the, the state oil palm company. And uh, what is important here to, to, I guess, to reflect on is uh, the way that this reshapes access to land. Because before the uh, PIR program was uh, uh, laid down, was uh, was put in place over there, well, the, the uh, Malay community, the Dayak communities as well, had an open access to customary land. All right, and they could uh, practice shifting cultivation. They could uh, also have their uh, rubber plantations, their uh, geta, right? Geta uh, garden farming, kabun geta, and stuff like that. But once the uh, large scale plantation is established, well, you have uh, closed off plantations, uh, which are only open to laborers, to workers. Uh, and of course, that, that restricts the economic opportunities for the local inhabitants. And if we try to <coughs> uh, modelize or, or uh, let's say provide a, a schema of the situation, well, we have the Perkebunan uh, Inti, right? <coughs> and the smallholder scheme. So in the middle here, you have the the public, the, the uh, oil mill. Um, and around you have uh, well the, the normal plantation, the perkebunan. But in the uh, perkebunan inti rakyat, what you have here is uh, basically the smallholder scheme. So the what we call the plasma, where the smallholders will all get two hectare plots, uh, and most of them will be transmigrants coming from outside the area. But also uh, indigenous communities will be provided with a, a two hectare plot as well. But in the middle, you still have the plantation where the, uh, I don't know if you can see my, my mouse here, but um, where uh, all the uh, smallholders will come and work in the first stages so they can uh, have an income while their own plot is getting, uh, while their old palm uh, is, is getting uh, mature. So the Indonesian policies they managed to create a robust all palm smallholder sector, uh, which is not negligible, which is quite an important thing, right? We, we cannot say that the all palm sector in, Indone in Indonesia only benefits large scale companies. That's not true. It also benefits a large population of smallholders who are now the majority 
of uh, oil palm producers in terms of land area. Uh, Fifty-two percent of um, uh, is it? Oh no, sorry, it's forty percent of. Uh, of the land that is cultivated by smallholders, not yet. But I think if we looked at the figures, at more recent figures, we would find that the smallholders perhaps now are are the majority. Um, but um, yeah, so that's the that's what we see uh, in here. Um, so uh, what happened in Sangao district? is a large-scale land acquisition, often with non-transparent negotiations. That means that the, the state authorities and the oil palm company, they arrived in the Malay or Dayak village, and they started negotiating with each family individually uh, about the way that they would compensate them for basically uh, taking their customary land. So some families were favored, others were not, and um, that created more inequalities in the, the local communities. And then once the land deals were done um, and the, the scheme was completed, right, that the forest or agroforests were turned into all palm plantations, then the authorities uh, allocated land plots to migrants and also some to local inhabitants. But the, the thing about this is that um, is contract agriculture. So everybody that who gets allocated a land plot, a two hectare land plot, is also indebted, indebted to the uh, company, and are forced to sell their fruits to the company as well. Lots of problems were noticed, not only in this study but in the literature. Uh, problems were noticed on these small holding schemes, right? The INTI, uh, the, the plasma, sorry. Uh, the, well, the shady deals in the land plot distribution. So some families were receiving two or three land plots uh, because they simply had negotiated, uh, whereas others did not receive any. Uh, there was also bad quality of land plots and low productivity, lack of technical support for production, land concentration. So as a result, Many families who arrived as smallholders, but also uh, local Dayak or Malay families uh, were eventually forced to sell their plot because it was not profitable. It did not produce enough fruits just because the, the seedlings were bad quality. There was not enough uh, fertilizer, so no technical support for, for making sure that the production was uh, adequate. So, um, it created lots of, let's say, winners and lots of losers as well. And uh, if we want also to modelize how it worked, when we can see that uh, the local plantation, right, uh, had all the expertise and the knowledge, but did not necessarily distribute this expertise and knowledge to the smallholders in the uh, plasma. Um, whereas in terms of capital and work, uh, people were forced to work on the uh, central plantation on the NT, right? And um, well, that uh, created what we call in in, in Marxian term um, uh, uh, half uh, proletaria. So it means people who are forced to work to earn a living and also to farm. And it also created uh, economic value, right? It also um, increased the, the land value for uh, areas outside of uh, the plasma scheme and benefited mainly to investors, to people who had money to buy land and to develop their own oil palm plots. And so that also increased inequalities. You can see all these interactions then between the uh, the oil palm scheme as it was developed and the areas surrounding it where people could grow uh, the oil palm fruits more efficiently uh, without also being forced to sell the fruits to the local mill. They could sell the fruits uh, elsewhere where they would receive a better price. Um, so that was the situation. And, and so it was important to remember and to remind that uh, oil palm production is extremely intensive. It requires a lot of fertilizer and it's not uh, possible for everyone to uh, buy that much fertilizer. Um, so it, it's not uh, that of a democratic uh, production system. 
and uh, another figure that shows the advantages of people who uh, were independent smallholders, who were not tied to the uh, local mill, but who could um, develop their own plots outside of the, uh, of the scheme. And uh, so you can see uh, how people were able to convert gradually their uh, rubber uh, gardens into uh, old palm plantations, uh, which was a, an advantage for some people as well. So uh, what we can say as a result, right, is that um, there's limited access to land, uh, given the, the local development of the plantation, ecosystem degradation, land accumulation dynamic. So some people are able to buy the coupling, buy more plots of land, uh, while others will sell theirs, uh, go somewhere else in the city or go back to their area of origin. And this is a, this has increased capital and labor mobility, which can be a good thing for some people. Um, and the uh, buru, the laborers who often came from this dist distant areas, uh, they often found themselves in a very paternalistic and uh, constraining system where they uh, have a very precarious jobs where they are paid by. Um, according to the number of fruits they harvest for men, or according to uh, the litter of pesticides they spray for women, for instance. So it is a gender division of labor as well. And uh, I've seen that in lots of uh, in lots of plantations, you have the managers who will uh, retain a part of the wage of the workers um, until uh, they have worked uh, long enough or until they have repaid tools which should be provided to the employees. So the plantation as, as being very large, right, as being uh, far off from uh, cities uh, is often exploitative. And I've also observed a, a gender division of labor on those plantations where, where uh, women will do uh, most of the pesticide spraying, the fertilizer application, uh, while men will be doing the harvest and the truck driving. So this, this gender division of labor is detrimental uh, to women in particular because of exposure to pesticides. And this has been documented by lots of NGOs as well. Um, so nearing the conclusion, um, just want to say that uh, old palm uh, production reshapes uh, the norms of success and failure locally. It creates new forms of disciplines and hierarchies on the bodies. Um, and when we look at the discourses, at at the images of this sector, we can see uh, an ideal of order and progress of development, cleanliness. Um, and uh, it's interesting as a representation, but of course the reality is on the ground is, is often quite different. So as a conclusion, I just want to say that uh, international pressure on all palm agribusiness in Indonesia has had some impacts especially given some uh, campaigns from large NGOs like Greenpeace for the protection of uh, species like the orangutan. Um, but also uh, private interests and the state of Indonesia have created new regulatory frameworks such as uh, the Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil. Uh, the Indonesian authorities have created the Indonesian Sustainable Palm Oil as well certification. Um, there are mobilizations to increase public participation in uh, old palm development, along with free prior informed consent. So this is a, a way of uh, making sure that the local communities that get involved in old palm production uh, are consulted. They agree, uh, knowing exactly what is going to happen. So that's an advance, but it's not implemented everywhere. Um, and what we could consider as well as some as a very positive outcome is the uh, increase in cultivated areas by smallholders, which means that there is a more democratic as, uh, access to uh, the uh, resource and to the uh, the um, yeah, to the resources and and to the uh, financial benefits of uh, oil palm. 
Um, so just to say a few words about the approach that I've chosen, political ecology, uh, you have seen that it allows to look at uh, policies, uh, practices on the ground. Uh, it enables the framing of environmental problems according to the socio-political context, allows for critical and normative analysis of social and environmental issues. Uh, when we say normative, it means uh, we try to uh, evaluate whether it's uh, uh, good for people, and uh, which would conclude my presentation. So, Trimakasi Banyak, thank you for your uh, interest. Yeah, thank you, Professor Franz. <laughs> it's difficult to, to, to uh, call you young. Uh, <laughs> Professor Franz, yeah, that's very interesting uh, presentation uh, about uh, oil plantation in Indonesia. Uh, it is quite similar with uh, the fate of uh, cacao plantation that's written by Tania Lee, I think, in, uh, in uh, Poso, Sulawesi. I did, I did work with uh, Tania Lee, actually. We did field yes. work together. and mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's quite similar, but... Uh, she talk about the cacao, uh, smallholder cacao in uh, Poso. Okay, uh, I think I do not want to, uh, what you call it, uh, repression again, uh, not repression, but uh, to, to give uh, another lecture to you. I think I just want to uh, give a point from Professor front that's uh he did the research uh, uh, using a political ecological framework that's quite interesting and according to the conclusions it is very important that if you use this framework you, you can uh, align with the socio-political context of the, the the research object and then the other thing is uh, that uh, oil plant oil plant uh, palm plantations that transform the landscape of Indonesia, especially in Kalimantan and Sumatra, or in recently in uh, Papua, that transformed from a small holding uh, uh, agroforestry to uh, large scale monoculture, and this is has an uh, impact on uh, environment side things. Even though we know that uh, oil palm plantations can uh, have uh, can be an uh, opportunity to alleviate the poverty in some places in Indonesia. So uh, I would like to invite you if you want to ask a question or wants to uh, clarification from Professor uh, Franz about the oil plantation that he has already presented today. Maybe there are some two or three questions or comments. So we have a lively discussion. And this is quite uh, important topic in Indonesia. Okay, I open a session question and answer. Okay, Professor, uh, sorry, uh, Mrs. Uh, Minar, you can you want to ask directly to Professor Franz or, and then the second one is Lucy is a student of uh, agribusiness study program. Only two. Is there any question more? Yeah. Okay. Okay, Professor. Uh, okay, uh, Mrs. Minar, you can you can uh, start your comment or your question. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity, Fafi, uh, Professor Frank, and Bu Minar. Um, thank you for the opportunity too. I really appreciate. Uh, to your willingness to give lecture and discuss this topic with our students. And I agree that Indonesian palm oil in its cultivation and job processing produce hazard to the global environment. But to convey, I want to convey uh, several reasons and as well as uh, questions. First of all, since the end of World War II, through the Uruguay round, three World Agency, three World Agency have been initiated 
namely the IMF, World Bank, and General Agreement on Tariff and Trade, or WTO, which ratify US dollar as the only means of payment applied worldwide. Number two, the Indonesian rupiah since 1967, at the era of our first presidential change until now, has depreciated on and on up to 40 this present day. While neighboring countries that celebrate their independence still are such as Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, and Philippines have depreciated or even appreciated their currency only around one to two digit present day. The book by John Perkins with the title of The Confession of an Economic Hitman and the recent result of Dr. Bradley Simpson, director of the United National Archive, who has access to our archive of authentic data, said that Indonesia was endangered by foreign powers to become bankrupt. Indonesia, which is rich in natural resources, become a prisoner to meet if the United States need waiver, and Indonesia itself cannot make significant profit from its natural resources. Number three, on the other hand, as a compensation for Indonesia, palm oil is one of the largest foreign exchange earners in Indonesia. Also, in terms of providing job opportunity, it can be underlined that palm oil Indonesia has an important meaning of Indonesia's macroeconomy. So my question is, first you are Indo Indonesian and Indonesia's executive officer, what are you going to do to make the real exchange decision with Indonesia's palm oil nowadays because it's already happened? This is my question. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I give back the time to Paevi. Okay, thank you, Bumina. I'm sorry, I can't get your question very clearly because your voice is quite uh, noisy. <laughs> I hope Prof. Frank can uh, uh, understand the question of, of Bumina very yeah. clearly. Thank you, Buminar. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure I understood exactly because just because the sound was not very good. Yeah. But I, I think I understood that uh, you were well. I enjoyed what you, you what you said about the the macroeconomic aspect of of uh, palm oil in Indonesia and uh, trade relations. But it is true that uh, global is, uh, international exports of palm oil from Indonesia are a very important uh, important source of uh, foreign currency. Um, and of, of course, I mean, I, I'm absolutely not saying that Indonesia should uh, stop producing palm oil. No, it's definitely a very important sector of the economy, a very, impor a very important source of vegetable oil for uh, national food security as well. Um, and it, it is also an important source of uh, foreign currency, which are important for macroeconomic stability of, uh, of Indonesia. Um, no, it's more a reflection about the, the economic model that has uh, developed in Indonesia, this large scale monoculture production. If you look at uh, uh, all palm, uh, production in, uh, let's say, uh, West Africa, in Cameroon, or in Nigeria, there you have a small scale production, small scale refineries of uh, palm oil. I'm not saying this is a perfect model as well. It's not, it's not ideal, nothing is ideal. But I think it's important to try to look at the, the system as it exists today and think about what could be improved. And lots of things could be improved. So um, it, it's true that Indonesia as a nation, as a sovereign nation, has the right to exploit its resources. So I think it is a neo-colonial argument to say that Indonesia should protect all its rainforest. It's not my argument, but I see it a lot among NGOs. But at the same time, now that the global community, now that the humanity as a species is faced with radical environmental change, degradation. Perhaps we do not have the choice to envision new ways of at least controlling all palm expansion in Indonesia, even though the nation has the right to develop. So it's a very complex question that you've raised, but uh, I hope I've, I did address some of the some of the points that you raised. 
Okay. I think she already answered some uh, question of yeah. Fuminar, I think. But it's quite interesting. I just remember that Daron Asimoglu, if you uh, know that he, he spoke and I do not know, that's a co-author with the other professor from Harvard University talking about why nation fail. One of the of uh, their argument is about the extractive industry, a extractive institution that installed during the in colonialism that still exists so far in some countries, including Indonesia. That uh, maybe it is quite uh, relevant in terms of uh, oil palm productions. What is the argument of Professor Frank is that I think uh, we should reconcile between uh that's uh environmental interest and economic interest so uh there is no any controversy with the uh, oil palm uh plantation in terms of uh, economics but we should be considered in terms of uh, environment i think something like that but i don't know whether my, my opinion is correct or not i think uh, do you have another comment uh Bumina? Otherwise, I will move to the next uh, uh, the next question. From <laughs> okay. do you want to? Um, okay, uh, I mean, uh, palm oil Indonesia has a controversy, but nowadays it has already happened. So, what should we do with palm oil in Indonesia? I mean, um, maybe it uh, we have to make it more efficient or to think with other cultivation or, or any, I, I think. What is the real action decision? That's an excellent question. Uh, uh, lots of uh, people are arguing that uh, the uh, oil palm sector in Indonesia is not productive enough. Well, if you compare the yields, right, the, the production per hectare on average in Indonesia, it is much lower than what it is in Malaysia. So it's true, instead of expanding uh, geographically the area under cultivation for oil palm, we could also intensify production where it already exists. But for that, it would require better technical support, better access to fertilizers, uh, better training so that people know exactly when to put the fertilizer, how to avoid the losses. Uh, it will require also uh, better material, better genetic material um, with, uh, with uh, improved uh, uh, properties or growth rate. So um, it's about the capacity of, of uh, national and provincial authorities to uh, better regulate, to better uh, transfer knowledge and technologies. So that could be one one thing to do. The other thing, the other thing that could be done is to uh, diversify the crops that are being produced. So to try to integrate agroforestry knowledge uh, and technologies into existing oil palm plantations. And that's also been developed as well, uh, theoretically, and, and uh, there are field trials also to try to grow more crops in between all palm rows or to make put more space in between the uh, all palms in order to grow different crops. So that would increase food security, that would increase biodiversity. So that there's lots of things that could be done. All that is necessary is political will and um, a vision, I think. Okay, thank you, Professor Franz, for the answer. Okay. Thank you, Buminar. We move to the next question from Lucia. Lucia, are you ready? You can uh, ask directly to Professor Franz. Okay, so thank you for the opportunity. My name is Lucia Darasari. Um, I want to ask a question to Prof. Franz about uh, so as uh, it's mentioned before that one of the new regulator, regulatory frameworks and certific certification that implemented in Indonesia in exchange to face the development of palm oil sector is RSPO, ESPO, and et cetera. So I want to ask, is there any challenge that uh, the government or 
uh, or everyone that include in that regulatory in implementing that new system in Indonesia. I mean the RSPO system or ISPO system or etc. in Indonesia itself. Thank you. Terima kasih, uh, Luisa. Uh, uh, what I, I know about the situation is that RSPO is uh, only uh, covering uh, a relatively small proportion of, uh, of production in Indonesia. It, it covers a, a larger uh, proportion, a larger share of production in Malaysia, uh, but it's uh, it, it's not accessible to a lot of, uh, of large producers and, and especially to smaller producers in Indonesia. So the state came up with the uh, Indonesian uh, uh, ISPO, Indonesia Sustainable Palm Oil Certification, and it was meant to target uh, smaller companies, uh, also the smallholders themselves, and uh, to accompany them in uh, progressive improvement of their practices. Um, but unfortunately, even though ISPO already exists, um, it has not been uh, considered uh, reliable by, uh, let's say, uh, uh, large buyers such as Unilever or uh, international exporters. Um, so it, the ISPO certification will not be good enough for to enable uh, some producers to export to Europe or to the United States, but RSPO is considered more uh, more reliable. And but of course, also the state of Indonesia already has lots of laws and regulations to try to prevent work abuses or uh, environmental destruction. But the problem is that uh, governance, environmental governance in Indonesia is so complex. You probably know more about it than me, but um, uh, due to decentralization notably, but also to the, the large size of the state, to the local power issues with uh, uh, within the provinces, within the district, it's very hard to control what is happening locally. Yeah. Is that answer your question, Ms. Lucia? I hope I did answer. <laughs> uh, yes, Mr. And thank you for your friends. Okay. Uh, Is there any uh, comment or questions? for Professor Franz in terms of uh, oil palm plantation in Indonesia. Okay, Ms. Uh, Ernois, you can ask directly to Professor Franz. Uh, okay, uh, Professor Franz, uh, some of the participants in this lecture uh, are students of scientific method course. So, uh, our students study some scientific method that applied in agribusiness research. According to your presentation, you applied the mixed method. Could you please explain uh, a little more detail about uh, mixed method? Because mixed method is uh, quite new for our student. Uh, I mean for a uh, bachelor student. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um... Yeah, the mixed methods is a use of both qualitative positivist methodologies and qualitative constructivist methodologies. Um, we recently wrote a paper on the use of mixed methods in hydrology. I could uh, definitely send it to you, but I will give you an example. If you use mixed methods in hydrology, you will want to know how much rain uh, we had over the past 50 years. You will want to have the most accurate data on uh, also, uh, let's say, water flow in the river. Uh, but you will want to also address an issue which is, for instance, uh, depletion or uh, lack of access to the water resource. And in order to better understand why local users have uh, less access to the resource, it's not enough just to look at the rainfall or just to look at uh, water flow. You also need to know how the local users see the resource, use the resource. So you also need to have 
yeah, qualitative data. Qualitative data is uh, not does not fall in the same paradigm as quantitative data. Quantitative data is associated to positivism, is more uh, considered as more objective, whereas qualitative data is more subjective. If you talk to a water user that says, well, I've increased uh, my production and therefore I need more water. Um, and I've noticed that uh, the neighbor takes even more water than me. Then you, you are into the realm of the perceptions and that allows you to better um, analyze also the hard facts, which are the, the, let's say the rainfall over the past 50 years. So in comparing both qualitative and quantitative data, you will know for sure that let's say there is perhaps the same amount of water falling in the watershed than, uh, than 50 years ago, but the use has increased significantly. And so then you will want to analyze the impacts of the increase on use and to develop methods to uh, better share, better manage the uh, water uh, resource, which is under more pressure. So that is also qualitative because there, you're in the realm of uh, human decisions politics. Why does, let's say, uh, a local um, company would have more right to access water than the local farmer? This becomes politics. This needs to be analyzed and addressed through qualitative met methods. So that would be the difference. I hope I, I'm not talking too much, but that would be the difference between a, a qualitative and quantitative and mixed methods is the use of both. Thank you for the clear explanation. Thank you. Okay. The next one is Angias, Angitias, uh, wet innings. So, so you can start your uh, question to Professor Franz. Okay, thank you for the opportunity, Prof. Franz. I am agree with your statement that time by time uh, we have better regulation, but the implementation is still for our big company. For example, 30% of Indonesian land fires occur in Indonesian forest and industrial forest and oil palm plantation. Uh, investigation by Greenpeace said that eight of, out of 10 palm oil companies that causes, caused the larger fire areas have not received sanction and even after five years data collection. Uh, my question is, what do you think about this phenomenon? And can you give a suggestion for our government. Thank you. Terima kasih, Ms. Anggitas. Um, the question of the forest fires in Indonesia is quite uh, old, right? Um, when I started getting interested in the phenomenon, which was already a long time ago, actually, uh, I'm not that young anymore. It makes me realize um, uh, about uh, 15 years ago, um, there were already very, um, very um, alarming reports about those fires. And not much has changed since then. I've read uh, somewhere that uh, during uh, the most recent moratorium, uh, some years there, the, the fires were less intense, that the haze lasted a little bit less long. But it's not quite sure whether it's related to the moratorium or just to a more abundant rainfall that year. Um, so it seems again that the governance problems that uh, I've uh, highlighted earlier uh, translate also in the forest fires. Um, the, the forest fires, uh, you have them all over the world nowadays. It's something that I've been quite interested in. Now, you have forest fires that will ravage, that will destroy, destroy large areas in California, in the Mediterranean area, area right? In Europe and North mm -hmm. Africa. Uh, you have large forest fires also in Canada, in Russia. Um, it's a global phenomenon that's related to changing uh, climatic mm -hmm. uh, conditions. Now, for Indonesia, obviously, the more people you have on the ground, the more people you have interested in growing old palm, the more fires you will get. Um, in order to really prevent it, there, the only way I see is uh, a very strict control, 
coercion, presence of local authorities, local police to prevent it, but it seems to be too diffuse, too decentralized as a phenomenon to be controlled efficiently. So quite honestly, I, I don't see an end to it shortly, soon. Uh, but perhaps if eventually the price of carbon rises significantly, people will have more interest in uh, pre preserving the forest and the soils rather than to convert it into oil palm plantation. However, I don't see that will it will happen soon because oil palm is still way more profitable than carbon sequestration, right? The carbon credits. Um, so it's what we call a conundrum or a wicked uh, a wicked problem in our uh, environmental terminology. So I don't know if you're aware. Yeah. And yeah, that's uh, the last statement is quite interesting that about the carbon price. What do you think uh, for the next uh, for the near future for the carbon price? Whether it can compete with the oil palm pr uh, price? Sorry, no, palm sure. oil price. Yeah. No, I, no I, I don't think so. I don't think it will happen soon. Because now uh, I think it's $30 per ton. That's the best price we have nowadays, I think, in Europe. Ah, okay. But the problem is that carbon is way too abundant on the surface of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not. It's very difficult to turn it into a marketable com commodity. We can mm. in specific projects, and we do. But yeah, it will take time. OK, that's good. OK, the, I think this is the last question, yes, from the Hagania, because our time is uh, very limited till 9.30 today. So OK, Dia, you can start the question for, for Professor uh, Franz. Thank you for the chance. Uh, I am the Hagania. Uh, I really excited to following this general lecture and meet you in here, Prof. Franz. Uh, and I just want to know um, why you uh, interested with pit soil and what do you want to know more about pit soil in Indonesia? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dea. Um, I think that the pit soil is definitely uh, nowadays the uh, most important type of ecosystem to, to protect. Um, Indonesia, I think if you look at the, the classification of uh, uh, carbon emitters or, or uh, greenhouse gas emitters, Indonesia is, I think, in the top three or four countries of the world. Uh, if it's not the second, I haven't checked lately. I think it changes every year, but it's mainly due to uh, peat soil burning. Um, so this is very concerning for uh, the fate of uh, global ecosystems. And uh, I cannot blame the local people or even companies for, for destroying peat soils. Uh, however, I think as an ecologist myself, I am concerned for the fate of our world. And uh, I think it's definitely worth thinking about the problem and trying to better understanding what we could possibly do to at least change the situation. You might have uh, seen that uh, uh, Brazil, right, in the Amazonian forest, it used to be deforested very rapidly. Well, it, it was still being deforested rapidly under the Bolsonaro government. I don't know if you've been following international politics. Um, but now that the, the, the Lula uh, government is back in Brazil, uh, we, we can expect to see a decrease in deforestation and more measures to, to protect the forest that is left. Um, but we've been talking about deforestation in Amazonia for, for the past 30 years. And 30 years ago, it was already alarming. It was already uh, very dangerous for, uh, for humanity, for, for the biodiversity. Imagine nowadays. So I, I feel the same about peat soils and, and, uh, and uh, ecosystems uh, more generally in Indonesia. I don't want to judge what people do, but I really want to understand. And I think we should all try to, to better understand. 
thank you for the explanation. Uh, I hope you can come and uh, see the good soil and research about that in here in next year. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can open my camera. <laughs> thank you. It's okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Ms. Dia. I think we near to the conclusion for this general lecture. And then I really appreciate for Professor Franz for your lecture today. That's very clear and then very important and give uh, enlightenment for our student and also for our lecturer in study, uh, Agribis study program, University of, uh, sorry, Universitas Sebelas Mar. So I think uh, this is the conclusion. I should end this uh, general lecture. And then I do not want to repeat. You can, I uh, think uh, we have already get a lot of information from Professor uh, Franz today. So I think we should have a picture yeah, before we close this session. Uh, for all of, all of you that uh, do not open yet your camera, please uh, turn, off, uh, turn on your camera so, so we can see your face. And then we can make a, take a picture together. Okay, turn on your camera, please. Okay, we will take a picture uh, for the first slide. One, two, three. And then the second slide. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, that's enough. Thank you, Mr. Effie. Okay, thank you very much. And another thing before closing this session, uh, we, uh, Agribis Study Program, would like to invite you to visit our uh, university, physically, Professor Franz if you have opportunity to visit Indonesia next year. And then uh, we also... I would be very honored. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> we also want to have a collaborations with uh, your university or, or maybe with you uh, as a researcher, as a director of research center yeah, in a level university. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much, Mr. Evi. And uh, yeah. I want to say I have the privilege also of directing our agroforestry program here, which is a master's program. Yeah. Uh, we, we teach in French at our university, but uh, we, it's also possible to study in English. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more difficult, but, but we can also accommodate. If any student is interested in our programs, I would invite you to look at our website. Uh, we have lots of students from French speaking Africa. But I think Indonesia is also such a, an important country. And uh, yes, cooper cooperation is important very much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's good opportunity. OK, I think because I am also the master of ceremony of this session, I do not know whether I should. Uh, maybe uh, Miss Ernois, you should uh, closing give a closing remark for this general session. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, before I close this uh, session, I would like to apologize to all of you if I use in, um, inappropriate words. And then uh, I also, once again, with thanks to Professor Franz. And then please uh, collaborate with us for the next futures. Sorry, not the, the near, near futures. Uh, so we can have, uh, yeah, uh, research uh, collaborations or general lecture collaboration or exchange student exchange uh, lecture in the near futures. Okay, this is, that's all what I can say today. And then I conclude this uh, general lecture for today. Thank you very much for all of you. And then uh, best wishes for all of you. Thank you and good morning. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Terima yeah. kasih, Prof. Franz. So, so what yeah. time in Canada? And now it's, it's 9.30 p.m. Oh. 
Nanti TPM. Ini <laughs> mana? Okay. I'm doing overtime today. <laughs> okay, thank okay. you very much, thank and you. see you again. See you. Thank you very much. See you.